All right. Well, that's exciting. You can all run out the door and sign up now. Go to our website to make sure that you are eligible for uh, these great prizes. You know, to have FaceTime conversations with players and sweepstakes to get lots of tickets. It's going to be great. Uh, so let's let's go over our our weekly update to make sure you all have the data as I get it. And our priorities continue to be kids in schools, and now it's about keeping them in schools, returning people safely to work, and also getting people vaccinated and reopening New York. So let's just talk about some of the numbers. Uh, overall, we're looking at a seven-day infection rate of 2.75, which again is trending in a better direction. I'm happy to see that. We still have some high areas. Uh, I'll be up in the North Country, uh, I believe Friday, which is tomorrow, uh, and the numbers are approaching 6%. Uh, that is a cause for major concern for us. I was in the Finger Lakes yesterday, uh, you know, coming down a little bit, which is good, you know, but still in that uh, area, we're not satisfied. So overall, the state looks good, and a lot of that's driven by the city of New York, which is still an extraordinary story. Uh, when you think about the population levels here and the people who are coming in uh, from other states and other parts of the country, and in a few, another month and a half, we'll be having people from around the world. These are incredible numbers, and I do believe this is part of our selling point as we're reopening our entire state, but particularly in New York City, when I can greet people from other parts of the world. Uh, I had a chance to meet the Prime Minister of Britain and the Prime Minister of Ireland, and uh, just spoke to a couple of California residents this morning, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Uh, this, all this is showing that we are coming back. We're almost there. And these numbers help give people the confidence to know when you come to New York, you're in a much safer place than elsewhere. And this is going to help us. But we can still do a little bit better here, team. Uh, hospitalization rate, watching this extremely close, uh, closely to make sure that we can handle the volume of hospitalizations, and uh, we'll talk a little more about that later, but we still lost 39 people, and there's 39 individuals no longer with us, their families are grieving, and in many cases, uh, it's, just, it's just a sad reminder that we're not out of this yet. Uh, hospitalizations, as I mentioned, uh, we're having some challenges. Uh, ICU beds, 24%, hospital beds, 33 overall. We can manage this right now. We can absolutely manage this. We're watching it closely. But if we start seeing those numbers, I'm prepared to take some action to start shifting people very quickly. And uh, we'll have more on that later. The daily vaccination rate, it's getting there. Uh, 50,000 in the last 24 hours. We have a few deadlines coming up. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, Monday's the big day. So I'm truly optimistic and hopeful that people who've been uh, waiting you now have a major incentive because Monday is going to come and we want to have everybody safely with at least one dose. So we are continuing to make sure people are aware of all the places. A lot of workplaces are offering vaccinations so we can increase these numbers and uh, get the numbers even higher. And I, and I feel that that's going to happen. We've seen that happen elsewhere when, when deadlines loom. So we'll be very interested to see what the numbers are on the number of people vaccinated over the next couple of days. Uh, 82, almost 83% with one dose and also uh, both doses, 74%. Young people, I was out there this week with the van trying to convince people to get vaccinated, mostly convincing parents uh, to have that influence over their children. And I spoke about the fact that as a parent myself, we are hardwired to protect our children. It's all we know how to do, protect our little ones as they get older, but certainly even as teenagers. And I would not want to be a parent living with the guilt that anything happened to your child, that, such as getting sick with COVID or even worse, because they were not vaccinated. So I encourage all parents to, you know, look at it from that perspective, continue to do what you're going to do as long as you're alive and your kids are alive, you're going to keep protecting them. And this is such an important way you can do just that. It's a way to show love. Breakthroughs are creeping up a little bit. This is what we've been watching. Now, again, uh, the hospitalizations are just, are still very, rather minuscule, but no one wants to get it twice. And the reason people get it twice is because there are still people out there unvaccinated. That is the only reason. And if we can get more people vaccinated and know that people are safe, uh, this is our, our way to finally come back to some sense of normal. But the, the vaccines have really been incredibly effective. I mean. These are more than even a flu vaccine. Those percentages are still very, very high, and people should be encouraged by these numbers. 
We also are going to be informing the public about uh, a new data source available to give out the variant information, two new micro sites to expand our data and uh, to focus on breakthroughs. Everybody wants to know what the breakthroughs are looking like. And we created this first in the nation methodology, which will be regularly updated. I mean, this is going to be updated almost in real time. And let the, power, let the public be empowered to understand, you know, what fact-based education looks like. I'm getting this data. I don't need to sit on it. I want to make sure everybody uh, pays attention and has this information available to them. So uh, these are the two sites that you can, you'll start getting our information so everybody can be part of this whole public health initiative. Boosters, uh, we are preparing for boosters as soon as they are approved by the FDA. We're also going to be taking our steps. What we do is uh, we're going to, we're waiting the federal approval and we're going to deploy a multifaceted approach to how we're going to increase education, accessibility, and acceptance of the vaccine statewide, the boosters. Now, a lot of people are anxious. Some people have already done it, but we are waiting to hear. We are hearing some news that they're encouraging it after six months, which will be a large number of people. Initially, it was, we were told it was eight months. And we'll simply get the information as soon as the CDC is done. We'll flip it over to our advisory community, uh, committee on Im immunization practices. Uh, they met yesterday. They're meeting again today. And uh, we'll be making sure that our health experts monitor this closely. So uh, CDC approves it. Get the okay for specific classifications right now and knowing that they're very likely to expand. And I just want to make a point about the people are saying, well, there's such conflicting information coming out of the federal government. It keeps changing and, you know, it's supposed to be eight months. It might be six months. I think everyone understands, uh, especially the information coming out of the federal government, everyone's doing the best they can. Their circumstances are evolving. We don't have a playbook on how to deal with the global pandemic, but I do trust the CDC in this administration. I trust the FDA, and we'll also have our, our other additional layer of scrutiny, but this will not delay us getting those boosters out to people. Uh, you know, as vaccine, it was the, the um, FDA approved Pfizer, uh, people who are 65 immunocompromised or other high risk. High risk, they're talking about people who are exposed, healthcare workers, people who are in grocery stores, people who really are frontline workers, and we'll be continuing, you know, we're ready. We know how to do this. We know how to set up the sites. We know a lot of employers are making it available on site. We know that the pharmacies are heavily engaged. We know we're going to go, be going again into nursing homes. So we are prepared. We've been working with our local partners, which is a high priority of mine to continue engaging our local providers and uh, giving them uh, all the resources they need to be successful. So if you're not sure if you should, you know, if you can, if you're considered immunocompromised, you know, the one person who knows is going to be your doctor and talk to them about whether it makes sense for you to get this shot. And we think it's really important that more people get this, just as that extra layer of protection, like putting on an extra winter coat as uh, the weather starts getting colder. So we're gonna wanna, we let you know there's already 8,000 people ready to roll for our uh, booster shots. And uh, we want people to be participating with this very intensely. We want everyone to get a booster as soon as you're eligible. I mentioned the Vax to School program. I mentioned my mom guilt. Uh, it was very effective when I was raising my kids. I still can use it once in a while, and I'm using mom guilt on moms now, uh, letting you know that this is really an important uh, uh, step you can take to protect your children, and our numbers, again, are not great, but I was out in Flatbush this week, and we announced 120 Vax to School pop-up events, which are everyone's getting really excited about seeing our van come around. So we're going to continue on that, and I, and I do want to thank... Um, all the teachers and everyone who's been engaged in this from the beginning, they, you know, the teachers who are showing up, I, I, I'm so impressed with them. What they went through last year, and I said this when I was in Flatbush earlier this week, they went through hell and back last year trying to figure out how to teach remotely. You know, do they have the connectivity? How do they put together a lesson plan? And then many times their own children were at home. Let's not forget the stress that they had to be under. And they persevered, they got the job done, and now, of course, everyone was anxious about coming back into schools, but they did. They are in our classrooms, and we're working very hard to make up for literally over a year of lost time in the, in the education and, and the development of our children as they were isolated from normalcy during the uh, early months or first year and a half of this pandemic. So we're going to continue focusing on that. Uh, we're also focusing on a deadline that is looming. Uh, one that has been known for many months, so there's no surprise, and that is that our expectation is is that all healthcare workers in the state of New York will be vaccinated by Monday. Again, plenty of notice, 
plenty of availability, plenty of chances for people. Many times it was the work site that has provided this. And what I've been doing and my team's been working very closely with our healthcare unions to ensure that we have continued care. Uh, yesterday we reached an agreement with nurses who, who represent, uh, the unions who represent the nurses at our SUNY system hospitals. And this is what I have direct control over as, uh, as state workers. And we want to make sure that we're rewarding them for the, the stress and challenges they were under and continue to be under. And this is just one solution. I'll be announcing a whole series of initiatives that we are doing to be prepared for a situation on Monday, which I hope doesn't happen. It does not have to happen, my friends. It does not have to happen. Uh, what is looming for Monday is completely avoidable and there's no excuses. And I'm asking every single healthcare worker who at some point in their life, maybe as a child, as a teenager, decided that they wanted to do something quite extraordinary. They wanted to dedicate their lives to helping other people, helping people when they were most in need, when they were most vulnerable, when they were sick, whether they're in a nursing home, whether they're in a hospital. These are obviously very caring people or they would not have chosen this profession. And I have utmost respect for every single one of them. And I want to say to the 84% of healthcare workers who are vaccinated, God bless you. Thank you for doing what you know is right. Because every single person who ends up in your care has the right to know that they are as safe as they can be, that there is no chance that they will be infected by the person charged with protecting them and their health. We can get this number higher. I'm confident of that. I'm grateful for those who've stepped up and done the right thing. And those who've done the right thing don't want to be with people who are not vaccinated either. It's, it's frightening for them to be with coworkers who are not vaccinated. If you want to think about that, they're entitled to a safe workplace as well. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to continue focusing on this uh, very shortly. And I wanted to also uh, announce, make an announcement today. Uh, Dr. Zucker has submitted his resignation, our Commissioner of Health. I agree with his decision. He has been a dedicated public servant for over seven and a half years. He worked hard through the pandemic, and I want to thank him for his service on behalf of the people of the state. And I will be saying that he has agreed to stay on until the position will be filled. Uh, he understands that I, in this time, I've wanted to take the first 45 days to assemble a new team going forward. Uh, that process is ongoing and uh, he understands and he respects that and he also uh, has an opportunity to uh, move on to new ventures and I appreciate again his service. Uh, with that, we have exciting news about the Buffalo Bills, the Jets, the Giants, the tickets, the excitement surrounding that and encouraging people to uh, participate in our sweepstakes. We want to make sure that all of our health care workers know how much I appreciate from the bottom of my heart those who've stepped up to be vaccinated and the unions who are working with us to make sure that we don't leave any facility short staffed, but we will have a deployment program that we're going to be announcing uh, in possibly in anticipation, but this can be 100% averted. I'm saying that now. I hope I don't have to say it again because uh, it would be phenomenally unfair to your coworkers, the people trust entrusted in your care, and all of New Yorkers that we will have our recovery held back by individuals who choose not to get vaccinated when we finally have this life-saving vaccine that in other parts of the world people are clamoring for. We have it here. And shame on us if we don't take advantage of it. Uh, with that, I think we'll take a couple of Zoom questions then go to our in-person. Your first question comes from Zach Williams at City and State. Zach, your mic is open. Good morning, Governor. Thank you for taking my question. <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk about criminal justice reforms uh, over the past year and, of course, in recent weeks. I was curious what your thoughts were on the proposed decriminalization of sex work. It is absolutely something I have thought about and I'm considering and I'm discussing it with many advocates and people who uh, have strong opinions on this. Thank you very much, Governor. Your next question comes from Bernadette Hogan of the New York Post. Bernadette, your mic is open. Bernadette. Hi, Governor. How are you? Thank you. Very good. Um, so Dr. Zucker has submitted his resignation wondering 
Did you or your administration put any pressure on him to resign, especially given the past year that we've had, and of course, his ties to uh, former Governor Andrew Cuomo and the nursing home policy? Wondering, um, do you have anyone in mind right now? Do you have any, any, any applicants that would be able to fill this post? And also, as a follow-up, um, you said yesterday that you were looking into temporary visas for foreign workers to fill these anticipated slots that might be um, empty in hospitals and nursing homes. So what is that going to look like? Where are these replacement healthcare workers coming from? What's the plan? Well, I'll start with the last question, see if I remember the first one by the time I get through. You're probably three and a half part question, Bernadette. Um, this is something that we have to work with the Department of State on first, and this is a conversation we've already been having to talk about the opportunity we might have in freeing up uh, the visa system to have some temporary workers come from places like the Philippines where many nurses go elsewhere. I literally had this conversation with the Prime Minister of Ireland when we sat uh, where I am right now and talked about, you know, do you have any of this? Everyone I'm talking to, I'm saying, do you have any health care workers you can get over to us? But it is going to be a Department of State uh, approval process that we have to work through. So this will not help in the next couple of days, but it would be great if we can, and we're going to be continuing to find ways to um, adjust our licensing requirements so we can have out-of-state health care workers, but I have to take some other steps to make that happen. And I think everyone understands that last year was a different dynamic in terms of the authority that was conferred to the governor by the legislature under the emergency declaration, and I have to work within the restrictions I have right now or to figure out how to get around that. So that's what we're working on right now. But I'm taking it very seriously. I want to send a message to all the health care facilities across the state. First of all, God bless you for what you've been through. I've talked to many of you, and I know that this is uh, an additional burden you were not looking forward to, but you also have all told me that you know it's the right thing to do. You know that all of us have a responsibility to make sure that our health care facilities are safe. People coming in sick, people who are immunocompromised, perhaps by nature of them being there, they need additional help, that's why they land in a hospital, or they need assistance, they're in a nursing home. These are the most vulnerable people. And those people deserve healthy workers who have taken every step they can to make sure they will not spread the virus to them. So I thank them, and we'll be we are literally working uh, the second I walk out of here, getting back to our effort to make some announcements to make sure that we do the best we can for Monday. It's not going to be perfect, if, but it can be. It can be a perfect situation if we can get the holdouts to understand the power they have to help us get back to normal. And I'm and I'm. Uh, pleading them to see it in that perspective. Uh, with respect to Dr. Zucker, I think I made it very clear on my first day in office that I'd be looking to build a new team, and I am building that team. I'm just taking some time to build that team, but uh, there'll be other changes forthcoming. But I do uh, respect everyone who's been a public servant. I thank them for their service. And yes, uh, Bernadette, I'm, I'm, uh, I know that there's been a number of individuals uh, interested in joining our administration at all levels, which I find very exciting. And literally by the day as we uh, tick down the clock that we impose on ourselves, will be more announcements about who those individuals would be. Uh, I thank Dr. Zucker for his willingness to stay on board uh, so we don't have a gap in leadership until uh, a person is identified, uh, is on boarded, and is ready to hit the ground running. Governor, this is our last Zoom question. This comes from Josefa Velasquez of the city, and then we'll toss it back to you in the room. Okay. Hey, Governor. Hello. Today, or later today, the city council is going to be voting on a package of bills that would provide minimum working standards for delivery, app-based delivery workers. I'm curious, is your administration looking into uh, the reclassification of gig workers or providing some sort of support for a lot of these workers in the big economy. I'm having trouble hearing the question. Can you? Yeah, she's asking if you're looking at anything to support delivery workers and establish minimum wage standards. We're looking at that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, we're looking at that. Yes, we are. And uh, God bless our delivery workers, too. My gosh, how did we rely on them so much last year? It was, it was incredible what they did. So, yes, we're, we're uh, taking a close look at that uh, later today as well. Uh, let's go to our the people who showed up in person. Start here, Zach. Let me ask you, there's an op-ed in Newsday today from an ally of Governor Cuomo's, which refers what happened to Cuomo as a, quote, coup. I'm wondering if you can comment, number one, on the appropriateness of using the word coup in light of January 6th, but number two, do you see this as an effort 
that is similar to what Trump is doing with the big lie, and does it undermine democracy and government and people's faith in it? Doesn't affect me. Uh, people will say what they want. They can define what they want. And I'm just going to not be ever, ever distracted by the chatter that is there now that might intensify. Uh, I'm in a position because the governor of the state of New York resigned, and the Constitution calls for me to assume the responsibilities as governors, governor, and I was sworn in uh, legally, properly, on the 24th of August, and I'm very proud to hold this position. Yes. What is your assessment of where we are with Delta right now? You, you went through the numbers and said there's, there's sort of been a leveling off. Yesterday, Governor Murphy described it sort of as a plateau. But by the same token, we're getting reports from the teachers union that mass compliance in schools is not great, that the kids are closer than three feet. So is this just a temporary leveling off with a, with a big spike coming? Or do your health people say, we've got Delta headed in the right direction? Oh, I'm not saying it's heading in the right direction because we are just hitting that point where we saw last year, people starting to head indoors. I mean, it's going to be spectacularly beautiful weather the next few days, uh, and then it's going to get cold, and then people won't be gathering so much outside, and people think a little more about going to the outdoor restaurants, although I think they're wonderful in the wintertime. And we'll have more people congregating indoors, and then we're going to hit the holidays. And I showed that on a slide a couple weeks ago, the trend of when we really started I'm going to say tanking, it was Halloween, Thanksgiving, the religious holidays in December, New Year's, all the way up until Super Bowl weekend. And we know that's coming. I, I, there's no chance that I am taking for granted that we'll have a slight trending right now where it's a little bit flat because I also know we had this sense of comfort in May this year. And if those numbers had held, we would not be wearing masks today, and we'd say we won. And then all of a sudden, the numbers started going up. So I've been monitoring this long enough and am steeled with the purpose of making sure that we are prepared for the worst at all times. It's like preparing. I am mentally prepared for a hurricane every 10 days now after what I saw. I'm, I'm prepared for the pandemic to continue until it doesn't. I'm not an alarmist, but I will always make sure that we are prepared. And I want people in school to be wearing the masks. They have to be wearing the masks we cannot afford to have shutdowns. Occasionally, we'll have that situation, but I'm not going backwards, and the state is not going backwards to a time where we have to have kids learning remotely or we have to start shutting down businesses. Those are always options, options I choose not to exercise, but I have to keep a close eye on where the numbers are going, and I'm not gonna feel comfortable for many more months to say that we have this under control. Yes. Um, in, in terms of the vaccine mandate, my understanding is that a federal judge has blocked the enforcement of the mandate until the court, case, uh, the court date next week. I'm wondering, you know, the city's vaccine mandate, the TRO, was lifted, but only after medical and religious exemptions were factored in for teachers. I'm wondering, is the state in similar talks behind closed doors? Is there a similar consideration, or are you standing firm in no religious exemptions? You told uh, you're referring to other religious exemption case for yeah. health care workers. And yes, we are in court on that on uh, Tuesday. And no, that does not prohibit us from uh, exercising this. That is a very limited class of individuals who are claiming that. I believe there's actually 14 or 17 plaintiffs in that case. Limited number of people. That has no bearing on our strict deadline of Monday. That, again, maybe I'm optimistic. That's how I always am. That people will realize that this is serious. That there's not going to be a change in my position because I'm not going to do anything that will compromise the health of the people of the state that I'm charged to protect. And I believe it's critically important for our health care workers to be as healthy as they can before they attend to the health of others. That's what this is all about. Then on Monday in state-run facilities, will those employees be suspended? Or can you, can you talk about what the logistics of Monday are going to look like? We are working out with the unions the exact details, uh, and that's been part of the negotiation, what happens on Monday. And uh, you know, that'll all be reported on as soon as everything's settled. But we are in constant communication with the unions who represent these individuals. And you know, we'll have an outcome in place before then. And I, I assure you, I'll make sure everyone knows about it. One uh, question. Governor Hochul, just a um, few questions. Um, first, you mentioned um, about talking lawmakers about getting uh, $1 billion added to the uh, Environmental Bonds Act. 
Um, have you heard from them, and if so, what have they said? And second, I just wanted to ask, uh, you have mentioned uh, bringing in your Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin as a partner in criminal justice. He is on the record as saying that he supports the defund the police movement. I want to know where you stand on that um, in your partnership as you begin to approach criminal justice issues. Uh, we did not support defund the police. No one in my administration does. Uh, that was a catchphrase that had very negative connotations. And I believe that we have to continue to fund the police in this state to make sure that they can protect, particularly black and brown communities where sadly and, and um, tragically, so many black and brown communities are being hardest hit. Uh, a young black man has a 10 times greater chance of dying of homicide than a white person. We need the police to protect our communities, but also to engage in a different kind of conversation that has gone on in the past. The status quo is not acceptable. There are reforms that can and should be and will be had in terms of better communication. And any time someone, a member of law enforcement, crosses the line, as we've seen, we saw too often even nationally over the last few years, there will be very severe consequences. But no one in, in our, our administration supports defund the police. And the Bond, Act. the Bond Act. We're having those conversations with our staffs right now. And uh, as I said, uh, you calculate this out, what the cost of a $4 billion Bond Act is for New Yorkers. It's the cost of dinner for two at Shake Shack. That's just one shake and one burger. I, I was there the other night. Uh, I think people who love their children, care about their their planet uh, will sacrifice the cost of that uh, once a year to be able to ensure that we have deployed all the resources we can to hit climate change from a multifaceted approach. And we're going to be very bold and aggressive. This is personal to me as someone who grew up in a toxic wasteland known as Lackawanna. And I love the people of Lackawanna, but uh, in Hamburg and all those other joining communities, uh, pollution was just a fact of life. And I want to make sure that we have a clean air monitoring first in the nation to be as aggressive as we are to monitor what our children, particularly in places like Asthma Alley, are breathing. So uh, as you can tell, you, you touched a sensitive area with me. I'm very passionate about this. And uh, I will, my philosophy, you'll see this in many areas, not just with the climate. It's all about go big or go home. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.